I'm pretty certain there must be life elsewhere. I mean, there are so many planets, so many stars, so many planets. And now with the Kepler mission, NASA's Kepler mission, looking at exoplanets, planets around distant stars, we know there are many, many, many of them. And if one just looks at the possibilities, we must have a good chance that there is life elsewhere. Because life is almost an inevitability of a planetary system with chemical disequilibrium. It's difficult to think that our ocean on Earth could be a good analogue for something like an icy moon of Jupiter, which is as small as our moon, has an ocean which is, oh, goes up to, I would say, eight, nine times as deep as ours, and has an icy shell on the surface. So how could it be a good analogue? Well, it could be, because although the gravity is less there, it's deeper. And therefore, the pressure at the bottom of Europa's ocean is effectively the same as we get at the bottom of our oceans here, where there is life. And it's also got oxygen in it, as our oceans do near the bottom. Most of life on Earth depends on photosynthesis and needs sunlight. So how does life actually keep going well below all the bottom of the photic zone where there's no light at all? And the answer is two ways, one of which is it scavenges stuff which photosynthetic organisms produce at the surface. But that's a bit boring. It's a, you know, not a nice way to do things. At great depths, and some of the hydrothermal vent areas which I've been looking at, there are bacteria which, instead of doing photosynthesis, do a thing called chemosynthesis. Same sort of process. Carbon dioxide plus water gives carbohydrate. And that carbohydrate normally comes from energy from the sun for us. For them, it comes from energy from the chemicals coming out, toxic chemicals coming out from hydrothermal vents. And they produce the bottom of the food chain energy for all the organisms that live there. When we want to look at a food chain, we've got to see who is eating what and who is eating who. And we use a number of techniques. For example, we can look at the fatty acids, essential fatty acids, for example, which make up part of every cell that everybody has. We can also look up the amino acids that make their proteins, as make, up, make our proteins. And we can analyze them, seeing what types there are, how much of each. But we can also do one step before, beyond that. Even though they may be chemically the same, they may have different isotopic compositions. This is not radioactive isotopes. Stable isotopes of carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, atoms which are similar chemically but are just a bit heavier or a bit lighter than each other. And we use those to trace the whole of the food chain from bottom of the food chain, chemosynthetic bacteria, up to the top, which may be fish or sea anemones. I think with a very, very interesting job and great people to work with, nevertheless, the most exciting thing for me in my job is talking to kids. Because they, A, have a phenomenal ability to get excited and respond and ask the most exciting questions, which then requires thought to make sure I can answer in language that they can understand. And if I can enthuse them and they can go on to do what I have been doing, well, that would be great. Mm -hmm.